Hello friends, I hope all of you are safe and healthy. So from now on, we will continue our remaining part of the lectures with online material. So I will provide you the, the necessary slides and the material and we'll try to help you to understand uh, these concepts better by providing with audio and video uh, explanations. So if you remember, until now, we covered the network flows and then we continued with the formulations of integer programming models. Formulating integer programming problems is very important. So please uh, repeat uh, and revise that material. It's very important. And in your final exam, you will have questions regarding the formulations. After that, we started uh, solving these integer programming formulations. And we, there are several methods to solve integer programming formulations, but none of these methods are uh, as strong as uh, the methods for linear programming. For example, the simplex algorithm. We learned that algorithm is very powerful and can come up with the optimum solution of the problems. But for integer programming formulations, we don't have that powerful algorithms, but still we have several methods. The first one of these was the so-called total enumeration or com uh, complete enumeration method. So we covered this in our lectures in the class. But if you remember, in total enumeration, basically what we do, we try all possible solutions, all possible values for the integer decision variables, calculate their objective function values, and select the one which has the best uh, objective function value. So that becomes our optimal solution. If the problem size is small, when I say the problem size, I'm talking about the number of decision variables. If the number of decision variables is smaller, then we can uh, solve our problems using uh, total enumeration. But in many real life applications, the number of decision variables is very large. That's why you will not be able to solve uh, integer programming formulations or mixed integer programming formulations using total enumeration. Or let me say it will take a lot of time. We are not talking about just minutes or hours. It may even take centuries to solve using total enumeration. That's why we need more intelligent methods. And we will learn throughout this lecture, we will learn basically two of such methods. The first one will be the branch and bound algorithm, which is, which is very well known and most commonly used uh, algorithm. And another one is the so-called branch and cut algorithm. But in order to understand these two algorithms better, first we need to understand what is a relaxation and how do we use these relaxations. So in this uh, slides, I'm going to talk about these relaxations and their uses. Before talking about the uses of relaxations, let's first define what is a relaxation. Uh, we use relaxations for integer programs, basically, and assume you have an integer programming formulation. It has an objective function, and it has several constraints, and it has sign restrictions and integrality restrictions. So from this program, uh, from this model, if you make some changes in the objective function, or if you have some changes in the constraints, these need not to be realistic changes, then you end up with some auxiliary optimization models. These are not real life problems. This is nothing to do with the real life. It's an artificial problem that you obtained from the original model. Okay. If these changes make your model easier to solve, either weaken your constraints or the objective function, then it is called a relaxation. Okay, so you have your original model, 
you make some changes in the objective function or the constraints and if these changes are weakening them then this becomes a relaxation basically we will not talk about the objective function relaxations throughout this course the most uh, important one for us and the beneficial one for us is the constraint relaxations so what's a constraint relaxation again if we make a change in one or several of the constraints then uh, and if this change weakens the constraints then it's a constraint relaxation you should either delete one or several of the constraints or make them weaker this uh, explanation is important we say that a model a uh, is a constraint relaxation of model B. Okay. If every feasible solution to B is also feasible to A, we can represent it like this. Assume that this is the feasible region of model B. So we make a relaxation. A relaxation means expanding the feasible region. The feasible region becomes larger but it not only becomes larger it should contain the feasible region of b okay so if the feasible region of model a is larger than b and contains b then we say that a is a relaxation constraint relaxation of b of course if they have the same objective function the same objective function should appear in both of them and the thing is, new feasible solutions in the relaxed model are allowed. So this part here, this shaded area here, includes new feasible solutions to A, which are, does not appear in B, but none of the feasible solutions to B should be lost. So let me give you an example. This is the feasible solution region of B. Okay. Then assume that we have model A with a larger feasible region, okay, but in this way. So this shaded area here is feasible for B, but not feasible for A. Then it means that according to this definition, A is not an, a relaxation for B. Okay? The feasible region of B should be contained in the feasible region of A if that is the case then we call it a relaxation and the basic idea of relaxation is why do we want to relax why do we relax in order to get some information from uh, for the original model why because the original model is difficult to solve we don't know how to solve it and it will take centuries to solve it then if we relax a model then the relaxed model the new model should be much easier to be solved Otherwise, it's meaningless to relax. Let's consider an example on uh, constraint relaxations. Assume that this model is given to us. So this is a minimization problem with this objective function. And we have one, two constraints. X1, X2 and X3 are binary zero or one decision variables. And X4 is greater than or equal to zero continuous decision variable so the question is in part a b c and d a number of uh, alternative models are given to us and the question is which one of these alternatives are constrained relaxations of this original model so let's start with a and let's have a look at it what is the difference what is changed between the original model and the model in part A. The objective function is the same. The first constraint is the same. But the second constraint, if you see, is not here. X1, X2, X3 are still binary and X4 is greater than or equal to zero. So what is the change? The change is we just deleted this first constraint. So remember the definition of constraint relaxation we either delete or weaken a constraint. So in this part A, we basically deleted a constraint 
it means that this is a constrained relaxation. What about B? So what is the change in B? Again, if you compare, we have the same objective function value. The first constraint is changed. It was the right hand side was 100. Now it's 200. The second constraint is identical and the sign restrictions and integrality restrictions are the same. So the only change is this right hand side. Remember the definition. Model A is a relaxation of model B if it contains all the solutions to model B. So if the feasible region is expanded. So this constraint is a greater than or equal to type constraint and we increase the right hand side. This means that the feasible region is not expanded. It's now smaller. So this is not a constrained relaxation. But if, for example, instead of 200, we change the right hand side to 50, so greater than or equal to 50, then we could say that it is a constrained relaxation. So we weakened the constraint. But since the right hand side is increased, we cannot say it. Let's look at part C now. The change here is, if you see, we still have the first constraint, the second constraint, the objective function is the same. But this integrality restrictions, the binary restrictions on decision variables is changed to all being continuous, greater than or equal to zero. So this is a relaxation and this is an important type of relaxation which we call LP relaxation. Okay, so this is an LP relaxation and uh, it is a relaxation, constrained relaxation. What about part D? Again, in part D we have the same objective function the first constraint is the same, the second constraint is the same, but when you look at the integrality restrictions, you see it x1, x2, and x3 was 0 or 1, but in this, it, they are all between 0 and 1. So the feasible region is expanded, it's not smaller, it is larger. So x1, x2, x3 in the original model, they could only take values of 0 or 1, but here they can take 0, 1 and any value in between them. So there are a number, there, is a, there are a large number of solutions in this relaxed alternative. So this is also a relaxation and this is also an LP relaxation. And if you compare these two, both of them are LP relaxations, but the model on the left hand side states that x1, x2, x3 should be greater than or equal to zero and continuous. But the right hand side says that they should be in between zero and one and continuous. So we call both of them as LP relaxations, but the model on the right hand side is a better relaxation. The information that we will obtain from this will be more beneficial for us. So what is continuous relaxations or LP relaxations? As I explained in the previous example, we treat any discrete variable as continuous and we keep all other constraints as the same and the objective function as the same. The model that we obtain in this way is called an LP relaxation or a continuous relaxation. These relaxations are very important because, because they are the most widely used type of relaxations because, for example, uh, the model that we obtain at the end of this relaxation is a linear program and we can use the linear programming solution techniques such as the simplex algorithm to solve these problems. So they are very important and in branch and bound algorithm, basically we will be using the LP relaxation. Now, after making, after defining the relaxations, let's talk about how, why do we use, why do we need these relaxations? What are their uses? 
basically we will talk about four different uses of these relaxations. The first one is proving infeasibility with relaxations. Basically it says that if a constrained relaxation is infeasible, so is the full model it relaxes. Remember the definition of relaxation. We say that model A is a relaxation of B if the feasible region of model B is contained in the feasible region of model A. Okay, So B is smaller and uh, the relaxed model is larger. And it says that if the larger feasible region is empty set, there is no solution there, then in the smaller one, it means that there shouldn't be any solutions, okay? So let's have a look at this example. This is the minimization problem with two constraints, x1 and x2 are integers. So solving this model, uh, is uh, this is a small model, of course, it's easy to solve, but consider that the, the larger version of this problem, and since it contains integer variables, the solution of it is uh, very difficult. It will take a lot of time. So what can we do? We can take the relaxation of this. And the most commonly used relaxation is the LP relaxation. Just relax x1 and x2, okay, and come up with this new model. Now the question is, solve this problem using the simplex algorithm. And at the end, if you look at these first two constraints, in fact, they are conflicting with each other. It means that there is no solution to this model. The feasible region is empty set. Then, if the relaxed model is infeasible, then the original model must also be infeasible. So this is the first use of relaxations. The second use of relaxations is computing bounds from relaxation. And what is a bound? A bound in this optimization context is a value so that the objective function value of our optimization model cannot be less than or greater than this. Assume you have a model, optimization model, and you know that there is a value, for example, 100. And you know that your objective function value cannot be more than 100. Your optimal objective function value cannot be more than 100. Then it means that this 100 is an upper bound for your model. Upper bound means this. Your objective function value cannot be larger than this value. On the other hand, if you know that there is a value, for example, 20, so that your objective function cannot be less than this value, in this case, the 20 is your lower bound on the objective function. So the objective function cannot be less than 20. So as a second use of these relaxations, we can compute such bounds from relaxations. And how? It says that the optimal value of any relaxation of a maximization problem yields an upper bound on the optimal value. Okay, so we have an original model. Uh, it's a maximization problem. You relax it, take the LP relaxation, solve it, you find the optimal solution. And according to this, it says that that optimal solution is an upper bound for your problem. But be careful. If your problem is a minimization problem, and when you relax it and solve, find the optimal solution of the relaxed problem, the optimal solution for this relaxed problem is a lower bound this time. So for a minimization problem, you have a lower bound. For a maximization problem, you have an upper bound. This is very important. Getting this idea, understanding this idea is very important. So the calculating bounds from relaxations is used a lot in the branch and bound algorithm. Look, the name implies branch and bound. The bounds are calculated from these relaxations mostly. So for this purpose, you can have a look at this figure here. Okay. So we said that when you relax a problem, the feasible region should be expanded. So the shaded area here, 
contains or it is the feasible region of your original model. When you make a relaxation, when you delete a constraint, when you take the LP relaxation, then the feasible region of the new model is larger than the original model. Okay. So in calculating the bounds, what do we do? We have this smaller model, we expand it and have this larger model. Okay. Now we are searching for the best solution in this larger model. And when you find that best solution in a larger set, that best solution should be better than the best solution in the smaller set. But be careful, I am saying here better should be better. So if your objective function is a maximization, if you are trying to maximize, then better means a larger value. If you are minimizing your objective function, then better means a smaller value. So the bound that you obtain from relaxation, whether it's an upper bound or lower bound, depends on if you are maximizing or minimizing. Now consider this example model, which is an integer program. In fact, this model is the set covering problem. Remember the set covering problem? You want to establish a number of fire stations, but you want to establish the minimum number of fire stations so that you can reach a number of districts uh, within 15 minutes. So what should be the minimum number of fire stations to be established so that you can reach every district within 15 minutes? and you are given the time to reach each of these districts. And using that information, we already formulated the set covering problem as a minimization problem. Here, XJ tells you if you establish a fire station in district J or not. Okay? And then our constraints are related with each one of the districts. So in order to reach district one, in less than 15 minutes, then the uh, districts that has a time less than 15 minutes to reach district one uh, should have, at least one of them should have a fire station. Okay, so these are the constraints of uh, our model and all of these X values are uh, integer variables, binary variables, zero or one. In order to solve this problem, so this is an integer programming formulation and it is difficult to solve, but we want to obtain some, some information for it. What can we do? We basically take the LP relaxation. Instead of these zero one decision variables, we change all of them to zero less than or equal to xj less than or equal to one. And then this is a linear programming formulation. We can use the simplex algorithm to solve this problem. And when you solve it, this is the optimal solution. These X tilde, the tildes represented, these are the optimal values. Okay? So in the optimal solution, we see that X1 and X7 are zero. We do not establish a fire station to district one or seven. X2, X3, eight and X10, R1, it means that we need to establish a fire station to here. But you see, X4, X5, X6, and X9 are 1 over 2. So what does it mean? Do we establish or not establish? Initially, we talked about this. If you run these values to down or up, to 0 or 1, the resulting solution has no guarantee of optimality, even it doesn't have any guarantee of feasibility. So this is the optimal solution for the LP relaxation, not for the integer problem. And we don't want to obtain the optimal solution from this one. We want to get some information about the full problem using this information. Okay, let's calculate its objective function value. When we just put these values into our objective function, the objective function is basically the summation of the decision variables. So x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus when you sum up all of these, you end up with 6. 
This is the optimal solution for the LP relaxation. And according to our discussion previously, since this is a minimization problem, it says that the optimal solution for the relaxed problem is a lower bound for the optimal solution of the integer problem. And what does it mean? It means this. If you solve this original problem with all x variables are being 0 or 1, the number of fire stations that you are going to establish will not be less than 6. It can be 6, it can be 7, 8, 9, okay? but it cannot be less than 6. So without solving the problem, we know that we need at least 6 fire stations. So this is the information that we get. The third use of relaxations is uh, getting optimal solutions from relaxations. Sometimes what happens? You have your difficult integer programming formulation, you relax it and you find an easier problem like linear program and then you solve it. So you have an integer problem, you take the LP relaxation which is easier using the simplex algorithm, you solve it. And when you check your solution, you see that all your decision variables are already integers. You relax them, you solve it, but they are already integers. Then in this case, you can say that that solution you got for the linear programming relaxation is also the solution for your original problem. So the basic idea is this. If an optimal solution to a constraint relaxation is also feasible, in the model it relaxes, the solution is optimal in that model. Okay, so again, we can consider the same figure here. This is our integer program. When we relax it, we come up with a wider feasible region. We search for the optimum solution in this wider region, and we see that the optimum solution for this one is in fact inside this smaller region. Then, since this solution is the best solution for the wider region, it means that it is also the best solution for the smallest, uh, smaller region, right? So if this is the optimal solution for this one, then it's also optimal for this one. This is the basic idea. Now let's have an example for this third use of the relaxations. Please consider this example, spend some time on this example and try to find the optimal solutions for each one of these, the LP relaxations or the asked relaxations for each part of this question. Try to find it by yourself, but by inspection. You don't need to use any kind of algorithm. By just inspection, try to solve these ones and then try to comment out if that optimal solution is also optimal for the original problem or not. In the following slide, we will talk about the results. Okay, in the first uh, part, the LP uh, relaxation of this model is asked. So x1, x2, x3 in the original model are 0 or 1. So we replace them with uh, x1, x2, x3 being in between 0 and 1. So remember, whenever you have binary decision variables, while taking the LP relaxation, although this is also an LP relaxation, this one is the preferred alternative. So whenever you have binary, we change it to this one for LP relaxation. But if xj is a general integer, which can take the values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then you need to use this kind of relaxation for LP. Okay. So in this first part, when you take this LP relaxation, what is the optimal solution for that LP relaxation? Basically, this remaining model is a knapsack model. And by inspection, you can understand that uh, by checking the objective function, we try to maximize it. And the decision variable, which has the largest coefficient, largest contribution to objective function is x1. So you want to increase 
the value of x1 as much as possible to make your objective function the maximum. And in this case, you need to look at your constraint. So how much I can increase the value of x1? And you see that this first constraint, x1 plus x2 plus x3, should be less than or equal to 1. And also we have this x1 should be in between 0 and 1. So it means that you can increase it up to 1. You cannot increase more. Okay. Then if you increase the value of x1 to 1, in order to satisfy this first constraint, x2 and x3 should be 0. Okay. So the solution is x1 is 1, x2 is 0, x3 is 0. By inspection, we get this solution. And this is the solution for the LP relaxation of the model. But when you look at this solution, all decision variables are also binary, 0 or 1. It means that it is also the optimal solution for the original model. So for this first example, the optimal solution of the relaxation is also the optimal solution for the integer problem. Let's consider part B now. So this is a little bit difficult to find by inspection, but you need to be careful when you again consider the LP relaxation of these binary variables we need to convert it to this form 0 less than or equal to xj less than or equal to 1. So now all these x values can be in between 0 or 1. And this is a maximization problem. We want to maximize x1 plus x2 plus x3. So in order to satisfy this constraint, if you thought that, okay, let's make x1's value equal to 1, okay, then this first constraint 1 plus 0, x2 should be 0. And in order to satisfy this second constraint, 1 plus x3 should be less than or equal to 1. So x3 also should be 0. So the solution is 1, 0, 0, you may assume. Or 0, 1, 0 or 0, 0, 1. These are all solutions. But the question is, are they optimal? In fact, there is a better solution. If you set every decision variable, the value of all these decision variables to 1 half, then we satisfy all of these constraints and the value of the objective function becomes 3 over 2. Okay, So this is a larger objective function value than 1. So this is the optimal solution. And the question is, is this solution also optimal for the original model? This is the optimal solution for the relaxed one. Is it also optimal for the integer problem? And the answer is no, because uh, these x1, x2, and x3 in the model, they are restricted to be binary, 0 or 1. But in the solution, they are 1 half. So it means that they are, this solution is not optimal for the original model. But what can we do? Using the previous use of relaxation, we can say that we can get a bound for the original problem from here. So this is a maximization problem, and for a maximization model, the optimal objective function value of the relaxed problem is an upper bound. Okay, So 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3, 2, which makes 3 over 2, is an upper bound on the optimal solution of the integer programming formulation. And let's have a look at the part C now. It says that the relaxation obtained by dropping the first main constraint. So we are not taking the LP relaxation now. Basically, we are just deleting the first constraint here. And we are trying to solve the remaining problem. This is a minimization problem. And there is one just constraint here. 10x1 plus 3x2 plus x3 should be greater than or equal to 8. Okay. So in order to satisfy this constraint, you want the value of the decision variable, which has the highest uh, coefficient, to be equal to 1. Remember, we didn't relax x1, x2, x3. They are still binary. They should be 0 or 1. Okay. We, are, uh, we need to set this x1's value to equal to 1 because it's also, also it has the minimum coefficient in the objective function. And the, since the objective function is to minimize, 
we set the value of x1 equals to 0. Then, in fact, this 10 times 1 is already greater than or equal to 8, so you don't need to increase the values of x2 and x3, because if you increase their values, they will make the objective function larger, but we try to minimize it. So there is no need to do it. So in order to get the optimal solution, we will have 1, 0, 0. And look, this 1, 0, 0, be careful. This should satisfy the constraint that we deleted. So you cannot just say that, okay, this is 1, 0, 0. They are binary. It means that this solution is optimal. No, we didn't delete it 0, 1, 1 here. You need to check the deleted constraint. Remember, we deleted the first constraint here. And it was x1 plus x2 plus x3 less than or equal to 2. Now, we need to take this solution and check this constraint if it satisfies or not. So 1 plus 0 plus 0 less than or equal to 2. It is satisfied. Then it means that this 1, 0, 0 is also an optimal for the original model. Okay, be careful with these relaxations. The fourth and the last use of relaxations is uh, finding some feasible solutions for the integer programming formulations. Basically, we call it rounded solutions from relaxations. I told you previously that you cannot find the optimal solution or there is no guarantee of finding the optimal solution by rounding the integer variables uh, from the relaxed problem. So assume you have an integer programming formulation, you take the linear programming relaxation of it and solve it, and there are some decision variables which have fractional values, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 5.3, okay? So you cannot just say that 5.3, so let's round it down and make it five. And the solution that you obtained in this way has no guarantee of optimality, okay? But the thing is you can get some information from those solutions. Basically, when you solve the relaxed problem and get uh, and round the fractional values to integers, you can come up with good feasible solutions. Okay? They don't have guarantee of optimality, but they can provide you good solutions. And in fact, we have this uh, idea here. We already know that uh, the optimal objective function value of the relaxed problem for a minimization problem is less than or equal to uh, than the optimal objective function value of the minimization problem. So this is our integer problem, which is minimization. When we relax it and find the uh, optimal value of this relaxed problem, it gives us a lower bound. Okay, but on the other hand, for this integer problem, if you come up with a feasible solution, integer feasible solution, then its objective function value is an upper bound for you. Why is that so? Okay, you have uh, the optimal solution for an integer problem. What does it mean? It is the best feasible solution, right? It is the best feasible solution. If you have just one feasible solution, then you know that optimal is the best feasible solution. So optimal must be better than this any feasible solution. So if this is a minimization problem, then the optimal objective function value is the minimum of all feasible solutions. Okay, then what is the idea? We can relax a problem. Uh, take the LP relaxation, find the solution, then find, uh, round the values of the decision variables to up or down and come up with a feasible solution. Then its objective function value of this feasible solution, if the problem is a minimization, gives us an upper bound. But be careful in this statement again. The side, uh, whether it is a lower bound or upper bound, depends on whether we are minimizing or maximizing. 
if your integer program is a maximization, then we already know that when you relax this problem and find the optimal solution of the relaxed problem, then this is an upper bound for you. On the other hand, when you find a feasible solution for the integer problem, not for the relaxed problem, but look, it is the feasible solution of the integer problem, then this gives us a lower bound. Okay? So this is the idea of getting uh, or finding some bounds from the rounded solutions. For this last use of uh, relaxations, let's consider this example. Please take your time to work on this example. There are three models here and for each one of them, the relaxations or LP relaxation optimum solutions are also provided. And now the question is, calculate bounds for each one of these problems, lower bounds and upper bounds. And in order to obtain the bounds, use the relaxation optimum solutions or use solutions that you obtain by rounding the fractional values of decision variables to up or down. Okay? So please spend some time for each one of these questions and the answer will be provided in the next slide. I hope you worked out uh, on these uh, by yourself. Uh, if not, please go back and work out by yourself. Even if you cannot solve, please try uh, or and spend some time on it. Otherwise, uh, you will be learning in a passive way. In order to learn actively, you should spend time on it by yourself. Okay, uh, let's consider part A now. The model is this one, and the LP relaxation optimum is given to us as 0, 1, and 1 over 7. All decision variables are restricted to be 0 or 1 in the original model, but when you look at x3, it's 1 over 7, which is a fractional value. Now, what we can do, we can find, we can use this optimum solution to get a lower bound for this problem. Why I am saying, saying lower bound? Because it's a minimization problem. And for this minimization problem, the relaxation optimum objective function value will give us a lower bound. Okay? So if you just take this solution and insert it into this objective function, you will end up with a lower bound of 10.57. Okay? So this is the uh, lower bound. On the other hand, what we can do, we can round this x3, 1 over 7, to either 0 or 1, so that we obtain an integer solution. But it should be a feasible solution. If you round it down to 0, let's see what happens. The first constraint. 0 plus 4 plus 0, greater than or equal to 5. So when you put 0, 1, 0, you cannot satisfy this constraint. It means that by rounding down, you cannot come up with a feasible solution. Let's try rounding it up. So 1 over 7, when we round it up, it becomes 1. 0, 1, 1, so the first constraint is satisfied. 0, 1, 1, so the second constraint is also satisfied. And 0, 1, 1, this uh, binary restrictions is also satisfied. So 0, 1, 1 is a feasible solution for the integer problem. We don't know if it is optimal or not, but we know that it's feasible. Now what we can do, we can just put these values to here, 0, 1, and 1 and calculate the objective function value, which is 8 plus 18, 26. So that 26 gives us an upper bound. It's an upper bound because this is a minimization problem. And for a minimization problem, any feasible solution, any integer feasible solution will be an upper bound. 
the optimum solution of the relaxed problem is the lower bound and the any integer solution for the integer problem is the upper bound and without solving this problem we know that your objective function value of the optimal solution be, will be between these two values it will be larger than 10.57 and it will be less than 26 okay let's consider the second uh, example here so in the second example the lp relaxation optimum is given as 1 0 3 over 7 this is a maximization problem and the relaxation optimum when you put it into the objective function you will come up with your upper bound now in the previous case it was the lower bound but now it will be upper bound because this is a maximization problem so 1 0 3 over 7 when you put and calculate it your upper bound will be 47.71 this is the upper bound which means that your optimal objective function value cannot be greater than this one okay now let's consider the rounding this solution up or down first let's try rounding it up 1 0 1 so let's put 1 0 1 to the first constraint it makes 2 plus 7 9 less than or equal to 5 so it is not satisfied it means that you cannot round x3 to up so we should round it down and we will come up with this solution 1 0 0 and let's try that solution 1 0 0 for the first constraint it's less than or equal to 5 1 0 0 for the second constraint it's less than or equal to 2 and the integrality restrictions binary restrictions are also satisfied this 1 0 0 is a feasible solution for you now put this 1 0 0 into the objective function and calculate the objective function value so it is 40 now this integer feasible solution for this maximization problem gives us a lower bound which is 40 look 40 is your lower bound 47.71 is your upper bound and you see the region is very narrow your optimal solution will be in between these two values so when you have a narrow bounds lower and upper bounds uh, it's easier to find the optimal solution but if the lower and upper bounds are wider then it will be more difficult to find the optimal solution using the branch and bound. That's why finding good lower bounds and good upper bounds so that the region becomes tighter, narrower, is very important. Okay, finally, let's consider the last example. Uh, so again, the LP relaxation optimal solution is given to us. But whenever you get this uh, such a problem, please be very careful. Okay. In this problem, x1 and x2 are continuous variables. They are not binary. This is a mixed integer programming formulation. Only x2, x3 and x4 are restricted to be binary. Okay. So this is the LP relaxation optimum. And when you put this optimum solution to the objective function for a minimization problem, you will end up with your lower bound which is 61.24. Uh, now let's try to round these values to up or down to find uh, an integer feasible solution. So basically you will not round up or down x1 and x2. They are already continuous. We will just consider x3 and x4. So we can round them down or up. There are different combinations, but we need to check uh, the constraints. So look, in the first constraint, we don't have x3 and x4. x3 and x4 are only in these two constraints. So if x3 is 0, x1 is already 16 over 3. 16 over 3 less than or equal to 0. It's not possible to satisfy. So x1 should be rounded up to 1. Again, consider this constraint. If x4 is 0, the right hand side becomes 0. x2 is already positive, 17 over 3. So you cannot put 0 here. Again, x4 should be rounded up to 1. So your optimal solution becomes 
this 16 over 3 17 over 3 1 and 1 now in order to get an upper bound for this uh, minimization objective basically put this solution into your objective function and you will end up with this upper bound okay so again you see without solving the problem we know that your optimal solution cannot be less than 61 over 61.24 and it cannot be larger than 78.33 this is the information that we get from the relaxations okay uh, please uh, repeat these uh, slides as much as needed to understand these concepts because they will be important in our next lecture which will be on the branch and bound algorithm have a nice day